Welcome. I am Alison Johnston, MSP, the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament and chair of Scotland's Futures Forum. And I would like to welcome you all to this online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with Scotland's Futures Forum. This evening's event is in conversation with Professor Suzanne Simard. We are pleased that so many people are able to join us online this evening, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from our audience as we get into our discussion. I am delighted to be joined tonight by Professor Suzanne Simard, who is author of Finding the Mother Tree. She is Professor of Forest Ecology in the University of British Columbia's Faculty of Forestry and has earned a global reputation for her research on tree connectivity and communication and its impact on the health and biodiversity of forests. Today, Professor Simard's work is taken as scientific orthodoxy and has inspired countless researchers, writers and filmmakers, as well as generating millions of views of her TED Talks. But despite Professor Simard's groundbreaking discoveries, she was initially dismissed by the male-dominated scientific establishment of the day. It would be years until the world took her ideas seriously. In 1997, a landmark paper in the journal Nature coined the term Wood Wide Web to describe her work, marking the dawn of a new era of ecological awareness. Her latest book, Finding the Mother Tree, has been described as a scientific memoir as gripping as any HBO drama. Welcome, Professor Suzanne Simard. Now, there will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the professor throughout the event. If you'd like to make a contribution, please enter your question or comment into the question and answer box. Be grateful if you could state your first name and where you're from, and we'll aim to get through as many as possible. But I'm going to begin with a question directly to the professor. I understand that you hail from a family who are some of the original settlers in British Columbia. And can I ask, can you imagine a life without having grown up alongside trees? Oh, <laughs> I can't actually. Um, you know, I. It's true. I, I I grew up in what we call the inland rainforests of British Columbia, which are um, these amazing forests, you know, huge trees, um, cedars and hemlocks, they're like iconic forests. And and so, you know, I've always had them around me. And then, you know, I have had on occasion, you know, the, the opportunity to travel to different countries. And um, when I was a when I was in my twenties, I went back backpack as a backpack tourist to Asia. And I remember I just couldn't wait to get back home <laughs> after after a while away. I I miss the mountains. I miss the forests. I guess everybody you know would miss their own home, but really it was the it was the trees and forests and mountains that when I finally got back home, I was like, oh, you know, I f I felt so much more at peace. Um, so yeah, they're in my blood and bones and DNA, and I can't imagine not having grown up among them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For those who are not familiar with your revolutionary, revolutionary work, could you give a brief summation of how you managed to change the world's views of trees? I know that's quite a big question. <laughs> I, yeah, and it's it's quite humbling. I, I think um, I don't I don't often think of myself that way, but um, it started out, you know, just just like everybody, you know, trying to. Um, work in the area that you're interested in, and of course, forests were were as we as we mentioned they were just part of who I was and I followed in my in my grandfather's footsteps and great grandfather who were horse loggers and um and I became a forester as a and as a young girl of course I couldn't I couldn't do the the heavy dangerous work I that was, this wasn't part of the picture um but I did get get involved in the field of silviculture which is how to grow trees and um and I I you know I observed that we were taking our iconic old growth forests and converting them into very simplified plantations. And <clears throat> and I was seeing you know that these were not very healthy forests, they weren't diverse, they were they were um they were really at risk of infections by diseases and insects. And so that's what got me going on trying to figure out what we were doing wrong. I mean, I, I felt like we were really unraveling these forests through our forest practices, and um, and when I was seeing these pathogens spreading through the trees, I 
started looking below ground at what we might have disconnected. And that's when I discovered in following some of the amazing research already done in the UK that in laboratories and in the um, in the meadows that that trees or sorry that plants could be connected by mycorrhizas and which are and mycorrhizas are these fungi that are you know you know basically obligate symbionts with almost all plants around the world certainly all trees all tree species depend on them where the tree provides um, photosynthate and energy to the fungus which grows through the soil and picks up nutrients and water and delivers back to the tree so the tree can meet its needs for nutrients and um, in discovering that these trees could actually be connected by these fungi um, that really showed to me that yeah that when we were converting our old forest to plantations or or even just deforesting that we were really disrupting this network and that provided avenues for these infections, um, these infestations. Um, it was really, you know, it was really degrading the integrity of the forest. And yeah, so that's how it got started. It was from a truly heartful place of being very um, disturbed by what was going on in our forest. And, <laughs> and I, I, I wish I could say that things uh, are different now, but we still have these same issues of, you know, of clear-cutting old forests, planting them to simplify plantations and, you know, disrupting these networks in fairly major ways. And, you know, our forests really are still not as resilient as they could be. But that's that's how it got started. And, and now today, you know, after many more years since that first nature paper came out, I've had my lab has been full of graduate students who have expanded on the story of what these networks do and how important are they and, you know, how do they help forest recover. So yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about some of that as we go along. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm heartened to, to hear you mention there that your lab has expanded and that you're working with graduate students who've obviously been inspired by your work. I mean, clearly, as I mentioned in introduction, you faced a lot of scepticism in that <laughs> male-dominated scientific community um, when you began this work. Did you ever lose faith in that period I suppose you've said there you're you know we're still not seeing the change that you would hope to see you know do you ever yes do you ever despair that the world is just not waking up to the ecological reality you know I mean it's taken a long time for sure and and it's been a big struggle but now I feel like you know there are so many things converging now on that people are really opening up their minds and accepting these these findings and so things like you know we're in a climate crisis we're in a pandemic um we're we're looking at you know people are going to be migrating to get you know to get to and from these different crises that are going on and i mean i see that in my own country we're we're already undergoing climate migrations in small pockets and um and so i think that reality has really hit home you know I'll probably I, I read that almost you know 80% of people on the earth have experienced in their own personal way some aspect of climate change. And of course, we've all been exposed to the, the pandemic. So um, yeah, I think people are waking up because they need to. We're in a crisis and, and looking for solutions. And, and there are solutions. <laughs> yeah, with regards to those solutions, how do, how do we proactively heal forests from human impact? Yeah, you know, that's the, that's the big question. Um, but there, there, yeah, we know so much. And so I think I want to send this hopeful message out there that we do have a, a lot of uh, good practices that we can apply to help, um, you know, mitigate these problems. So, for example, um, I can give you three ideas. <laughs> One of them is that, you know, in large parts of the world, um, whether it's the west coast of North America or the boreal forest across Canada, Russia and the Scandinavian countries or the tropical forests across, you know, uh, South America and Indonesia and so on. Those places, there's still a lot of old growth forests left. Well, I should say there's still intact old growth forests left. I, I, I'm going to backtrack it. There's not, a, there's not as much as we've had. We've lost about a third of those forests worldwide from land use change and other practices, but we still have a substantial amount left. And the first thing that we need to do is protect those forests because those forests, you know, intact forests are actually absorb um, or store about 70 to 80% of our terrestrial carbon. 
And, you know, if we keep these forests intact and then restore our remaining forests, scientists are saying that, you know, these kind of practices can actually absorb about 35 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. And so really, you know, it really is in our favor to really focus on this. Um, of course, the other things that the other 65 percent um, comes from things like mitigating fossil fuel consumption, um, decarbonizing our energy sector as quickly as we can. And of course, cement production, we also know is a major issue. Um, so those things aside, in forests, you know, conserving old growth forests or old primary forests is the first thing that we we should do because um you know there's no amount of planting trees which i know that people really want to do but tr planting trees is not going to add up to the same mitigation that's provided by saving what we have still remaining because these old forests store a ton of carbon tons and tons of carbon the second thing that we can do is is to go into forests that are damaged and and restore them and so that does involve tree planting. It also involves favoring the um, the advanced growth of older trees, letting them grow out through their whole lifespan instead of cutting them down, you know, in 50 or 60 years, but just actually letting them grow old so that they can accumulate carbon in the ecosystems. Uh, so that's the second thing. Um, the third thing that we can do is that on areas that were forested at one time that could support forests, we can convert those damaged ecosystems back to forests. That's called afforestation. Really, it's like making a new forest. Um, and I, th I think that there are, there's definitely room for that in, in, around the world. And I think that's the hope with this, these plans for planting a trillion trees is to try to get some of those places back into forests. And then the last thing I'm going to mention <laughs> is that when we, we are going to still need wood, right, in the future, is when we do harvest trees, do it sustainably um, to, to make sure we leave the legacies in the forest so that they can be bootstrapped into the next generation. We need the gene banks, for example, of the old trees. Um, we need to, to leave these old trees behind and then take, take out a few trees as we need them. But this is a major shift away from the current practices, which are predominantly to clear cut forests um, and plant them to monocultures. Thank you so many. Um points there that I'd like to pick up on, but I'm going to a question from Stu. And Stu asks, how does one get into silviculture? Do you need more pe people specialising in this skill? And he'd also like to know, how soon can he start? <laughs> Thank you, Stu. That's a great question. And I encourage you with all my heart to go and do that. Um, we don't have enough people working in silviculture. Um, and really, this is, you've hit on one of the major solutions, I think, and that is that, you know, people, you know, over time, over the last hundred years have moved away from, from the land and into cities. And that means that we have less knowledge and, and fewer people looking and knowing the land. And really, we need to understand, you know, we need to understand the places that we're in. For example, as a silviculturalist growing trees, you would need to know, you know, what are the, the native species there? Or what species can you introduce there if there are no native species um, that are left? Um, and how do you manage them? And, and how do you keep them adaptive and um, still resilient as climate is changing? Because that change is going to be continuous and, and, episo and episodic as well. There's going to be episodes where it's more severe than other times. And that's going to require uh, healing of the land. And to heal the land, we have to have eyes on the ground. We have to have real practitioners out there. And so that was where the silviculturalist comes in. And the silviculturalist, it's, it's a, uh, a position that, that is, you know, needs to be more and more highly valued, um, where, where you're, you know, you really are using all of your mind, all your understanding to bring to bear on this global issue of how do we keep our, our planet green and continuing to take up carbon. Um, and just one more comment I'll make is that, you know, over the last, I've watched over the last 20 years or more that, there's been fewer and fewer silviculturalists. There's fewer and fewer people on the land as we move towards a more digital world. Um, and we also move more towards genetic or, or quick solutions. And I, I shouldn't say genetic is a quick solution, but there's been more of a focus on that than in ecology. And um, 
And so I encourage anybody who's listening, especially you, Stu, you know, that you're interested in this to to pursue this um, because we need you. And uh, and there are forestry schools around the world that that train in this area. And, you know, you can easily find them. Um, I think there's a forestry school in Aberdeen in, in Scotland, actually, um, if you're to stay home. But certainly I work at UBC, which has a, an excellent forestry faculty as well. And I think these faculties have undergone huge changes because of the, you know, of the, uh, I don't know, I would say this shift, this cultural scientific shift has happened over the last 20 years, but it's going to shift back again as our needs become more evident and we need more experts um, like you're going to be, Stu, I hope, in the future. Thank you. I think that was a very empowering and inspirational call there for those who, who'd like to get involved. Uh, it, you know, I just can't think of yet more useful work. Um, so I'm sure we really appreciated your response. I have a question from Vivian. Can the fungi so essential to intact forests be replaced or introduced? And how quickly can anything even resembling a functioning forest be built up? That's a great question. It, it depends on where you're starting from. Um, but let's say you're in Scotland. <laughs> I've been I've been to your beautiful country a couple of times, and I love it. Um, the you know you I think that at one time Scotland and you've got remnants of these forests have, was forested, um, and then there was a sort of a huge deforestation events or events over time of conversion to agricultural land. Um, and in that that sort of conversion, you do you know have a wholesale below shift in the below ground fungal communities. At least we've learned that from our forests in British Columbia, where where forests are converted to or or we lose the sort of like the foothold of the forest on the land. So what we find is that in a forest, for example, that might have let's just say a baseline of a hundred fungal species. Uh, all different with their different niches in a forest. That's about on average what there is in our native forest here. Um, when you convert them to say a, um, a grassland or a, a simplified com community, the first thing that you do is you lose a lot of those native native fungal species that are associated with the trees that were there. You know, they're they're very specific. A lot of them are very specific to tree species, or at least specific to um, to genera or families of trees. Um, and, you know, heathlands or grasslands form a whole different suite of, of mycorrhizal fungi, the, these helper fungi, than trees. You know, they, they, they tend to be the, you know, what we call our buscator mycorrhizas, which don't really associate with trees, uh, unless, you know, there are some that, that trees that do, like the yew tree and the willows and um, cottonwoods, um, cedars, uh, cypress, they form our buscator mycorrhizas, but but the pines and birches and oaks all form this other group called ectomycorrhizas. So if it's if if the conversion has happened over like for a long period of time, you would have to bring those ectomycorrhizas back into the community to get trees established again. Um, and there is a long history through the world of of bringing trees into these kinds of communities. Um, and then, or even migrating things like Douglas fir has been migrated over to New Zealand and Australia and Chile and and Scotland, I think. Um, and uh, and and what's happened is that at first it, that these migrations failed because the mycorrhiza community wasn't there to help them along. And so once people figured out that they needed the soil inoculum to go along with it, they started introducing the inoculum along with it. And that really allowed these trees to get going. So that is, a, we have a good history that we can do that, right? We can introduce inoculum and you can purchase inoculum. You can also bring it um, from an intact forest nearby. For example, I know in Scotland, you have places where there is still forest left and you can actually re-inoculate um, areas that you're trying to aforest or, or reforest um, that have been in fallow for a long period of time. So, yeah, and, and I've successfully done this in lots and lots of exper exper experiments myself in trying to restore grasslands or even restoring old mine spills um, where we've brought in migrated or transferred soil from intact forests and really the seedlings get going and, they're, and they do really well. So, yeah. Thank you. I have another question from Ian in Creef this time. When reforesting, it would seem that diversity may be the key to combating the numerous pathogens that are attacking our trees. 
Should we plant no more than 20% of any single species in a reforested area, with maybe the young trees of each species being sourced from different areas? That's Ian's question. Yeah, Ian, that's a great question. And really, this is this kind of harkens back to Stu's question about knowing your land um, and knowing what species belong where. And and so I think I would be hesitant to to put a number on the proportion, like 20%. It depends on what belongs there to begin with, what's well adapted to that location. Um, for example, in, in some of our forests in Canada, we have huge areas of land that are predominantly lodgepole pine um, with some aspen and spruce mixed in. And so, and, and it comprises naturally about, you know, a high proportion of the community, over 50%. And so to say, oh, we're only gonna have 20% lodgepole pine, it would actually not be good for those ecosystems because that's, that's the species that's well adapted. Um, so you really have to know your land, what belongs there, you know, the kinds of disturbances that are coming along. Um, but certainly, you know, having a diversity of species um, what naturally fits is what you would aim for. So understanding the natural patterns that were out there prior to or in or in similar areas. And then you're absolutely right that that diversity is absolutely essential. Once you match it up properly, it's absolutely essential to for you know for keeping forests um, healthy and resilient and resistant to infections and infestations. Um, so there's a couple of ways I can describe this, but one is if you have a diversity of species, let's say you have, you know, 10 species instead of just one of trees, then if there is a specific insect that is, you know, specifically attacks or infests that one species that maybe you've planted, you know, over 100% of the area, if it, if that insect or, or pathogen takes off or becomes epidemic, then it will take out that one whole forest if it's only comprised of one species. If there's 10 and that's only comprising 10% of the population or of the community, then you'll still have all those other trees left that are not susceptible to that particular that particular uh, uh, pest um, or herbivore or pathogen. Another thing is <laughs> diversity, you know, this also, you know, this works in so many ways, but diversity also increases resilience or resistance of individual trees to infection because they're healthier um, and they're growing better because they have a community of companion trees and plants. So um, it, this in, in ecological theory, we call this niche complementarity where species complement each other. You know that that some species will have the ability, for example, to to fix nitrogen, and that improves the nutrition of all the trees around them. And when the nutrition of the trees are is high, they tend to have more resistance to diseases, just like us, like we humans do as well. When we're healthy, we don't get flus and um, we don't get sick as much. It's the same thing in forests. And so that diversity is really, really important in keeping the health of the forest up. Um, I could, I, you know, I have got more things on this, but I think I'll wait for the next question and try to build that in. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question comes from Mark, and it is, how widely are your ideas about good forest management now accepted? Is there still a significant challenge in getting those ideas accepted? <laughs> what are any barriers? And are there any areas or countries of best practice that you would highlight? Yeah, so many great questions. Um, I would say where I'm from in Canada, and, and I would venture that this is true around the world, just because, you know, we, we've moved economically towards you know, sort of the concentration of, of uh, ownership of wealth in the hands of a few. And that's true in forestry. So, for example, where I'm from in British Columbia, we used to have many, many mills and small companies, and they've merged into five major companies now and and so they basically have jurisdiction over huge amounts of land and the, or or resources they have licenses to harvest huge areas of forest and and because it's economically driven instead of ecologically driven they tend to go for the cheapest you know most expedient way to reforest to to log for one and to, then to reforest so the logging by and large is still clear cut logging where they don't leave big old trees behind which is what my research shows that you should be keeping old trees 
um, so that they have a diversity of fungi associated with them, that they connect the forest, that they form the nucleus around which forests can re recover. Um, and, and so the cutting patterns haven't changed. And then, you know, how we reforest, we are still um, trying to reduce diversity in forests by, you know, by trying to uh, concentrate resources on those individual trees that in the monoculture or in the planted forest um, with the idea that, you know, all these other plants are competitors rather than, you know, part of a community. And so I would say, you know, no, things haven't changed. Um, in fact, in, in some ways they've gotten worse as we've gone down this economic model of concentration of wealth and ownership. Um, and we really do need to diversify that, just like in, you know, economics and ecology, both need diversification so that we can have a diversity of ideas and practices put in place that will make a more diverse landscape. Um, so, um, yeah, it's there, there's a long ways to go, but it's hopeful because, um, you know, more and more people are understanding how crucial it is that we do transform forestry practices, that we do need to, you know, conserve and restore and, um, and aforest, that we need to figure out better ways of leaving the legacies behind in ecosystems so that they can become healthy forests in the future, so that there are good gene banks, there are good, there's good soil left, there's still a lot of carbon and nutrients in the soil. We, we know now we really need to focus on doing this. Um, and and the, it's seeping into public awareness. And so I think that once that awareness is there and people are feeling the crunch and the pressure from climate change, that, that they'll pressure their governments uh, to, to, to to try these different methods that are much more uh, holistic and ecologically sound. And I can't remember the other parts of the question, but. Yeah, no, I think that was a very fulsome response. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, can you tell us more about your current work on whether whether trees can distinguish us as human beings? Ah. What, do trees, what do trees know? Yeah, trees know a lot. Holy. So, um, you know, trees um, actually are evolutionarily much older than us. Um, and we, you know, we all kind of evolved from the same basic genetic material back, you know, millions of years ago, um, you know, four million years ago. And so um, a lot of the, you know, the genetic uh, makeup of, of us comes comes from the genetic makeup of our predecessors, of our ancestors, which includes the trees. Um, and, and so, um, so because of that legacy, because of that gene pool, um, we share a lot of things in common. And so let me just talk about some of those things. Um, so one thing, you know, you know how humans, we're very social creatures, right? We live in communities and we specialize, we have, you know, we have politicians and we have bakers and we have school teachers and, you know, the whole complex system that makes a, makes a, a, a country or a community work. It's the same thing in forests that, you know, the trees grow in communities as well. They're very social. Um, they don't grow by themselves. They're a consortium of, uh, of, of many species, many individuals, and even across different kingdoms of organisms. For example, the symbiosis between fungi and trees. It's the community, it's that symphony of organisms that really makes a forest healthy and vibrant. Um, yeah, so, and so um, what do trees do? How do they do this? Well, one of the things they do is they, they connect below ground through mycorrhizal fungi. And I wouldn't say it's not just the fungi, they're connected and have pathways or networks with many other creatures. It's just that the fungi are really cool because we can actually see these networks. We can see the trees linked together. We can, you know, we can make maps of these networks. But bacteria also do this. They form biofilms and they connect individuals through biofilms right along the mycorrhizal networks, for example. And, and through those networks, the microbial networks, the fungal networks, there's a lot of communication going on. So trees will, you know, transmit resources back and forth between them um, according to who needs more. Um, so they'll transmit carbon and nitrogen and water and phosphorus. Um, the, and then our later studies um, are they also um, transmit information about things like identity. And I think that gets to your question about perception of identity. Who's around me? You know, so the trees perceive their neighbors. They know who is related and who is not among in the plant world. We, we've done lots of experiments to show this. Um, and they respond differently. The neighbors respond according to the identity 
uh, of their neighbor and they send messages back and forth and they actually favor when, one of the things we found out is that that old trees will favor their kin if they recognize kin that seeds from their own cone crops for example um, as for people, um, certainly when, when we do experiments like we, you know, purposely injure a tree or shade a tree or, or pull its needles off, trees go into an instant response, right? They change their biochemistry almost instantly. They start to go through all kinds of um, hormonal responses. Um, you know, they'll elicit, if, if it's an injury, like if I pull the leaf off, a off of a tree or a needle, it will trigger these um, defense responses in the trees. They'll start to make enzymes and monoterpenes to defend themselves against this. And what we found is that, that these trees through their mycorrhizal networks also transmit this information about defense to their neighbors and then the neighbors upregulate their own defense machinery and they defend themselves. And so, yes, um, you know, the fact that, you know, we can measure this when we injure a tree tells us that, yes, they can, they, of course, um, are responding and, 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 and are to us. They have the, a way of perceiving us, just like they do when, a, for example, a squirrel, you know, clips off a cone or, um, you know, or <laughs> anything that might, you know, feed on the bark or, or, or rip off needles or just, just any animal or organism that does that also elicits these kinds of responses. And so, yes, yeah, so they can, they can, and they can distinguish whether, you know, for example, a caterpillar eats a leaf or a person pulls off the leaf. They have a different uh, degree and amount and uh, type of biochemical response to that. So, yeah, it's intriguing, it's interesting. It's not something that I've directly got, sought out to say, can they perceive us? But through our experimentation in different ways, I understand that they do uh, are able to distinguish. That, that's incredible. You know, you're, you're saying they'll know if it's if it's a squirrel or if it's a, a person, and yeah, just that level of um, awareness. So it must be hugely traumatic if we see large scale logging of a an ancient forest. You know, we've we've <laughs> seen, some, you know, there's been some I think documentaries on on TV here in recent weeks just showing what's happening with regards to you know clearing sites for for meat production and so on. We're you know we're seeing almost straight lines, you know, right angles of ancient forest beside nothing um, at the moment. I mean, that must be very, very traumatic for those forests. Is, th is that what you're telling us? It, it is. It's traumatic. It's, um, of course, you know, by, by clear cutting trees, you're killing the trees. Um, there's no there's no two ways about it. Um, you know, once you take off the photosynthetic crown, <laughs> cut the tree down, that you know the root system dies within you know a, a very very quickly. It's basically you've killed the tree, um, and, and of course you know of course the tree is going to respond to its own death. <laughs> um, so yeah, it is traumatic. Uh, the other thing that's traumatic about it is that the that it there are ripple effects all through the ecosystem. So it's not just the tree that goes, but all of the symbionts, the fungi, the bacteria, the soil food web is also turns over, it changes. Um, so it'll change from what it was in the forest, which would be very diverse and highly tightly coordinated in a complex system to kind of a, a more a weedy kind of environment, you know, where a lot of weedy species come in. Fungi that are easy to grow on, on grasses or thistles or whatever the invasive plants might be. Um, so the whole soil food web changes over. And along with that goes a change in the soil carbon pools, nitrogen pools, the water. Um, so for example, let, just to go through, you know, an explanation of what happens, let's say you, you have a forest, cut down all the trees, um, because you no longer have a crown that's photosynthesizing anymore, you know, the canopy, um, it's also not transpiring anymore because Photosynthesis goes along with transpiration. That's the emission of water into the atmosphere. And so the area, um, or at least the canopy, will be dried out because there's no transpiration. But what, and so what happens is that water stays in the soil and the water table rises up. So when the water table rises up, um, you can get flooding. Uh, the other thing that happens is when the root systems die back, that the pores in the soil you know the little holes in the soil that's where all the the bugs like live in and they get soil they get air in the soil that's where soil water is regulated 
um, those collapse in a lot of cases. And so in the collapsing soil and the rising water table, this can result in runoff. And so you can get erosion in, in those cases. The other thing that happens is that, you know, um, you take the trees off and those trees are turned into different forest products like toilet paper or paper or pulp or sometimes into long-term wood products like houses. Um, but the other part that's affected is what's below ground. And so um, as this water table is rising up, the soil is also heating up because there's more sunlight coming onto the forest floor or onto the onto the ground. And so decomposition also speeds up. So you start to get, you know, these soil organisms will start, um, because it's warmer, their, their life cycles speed up. And so they start to decompose uh, the, the organic material that's in the soil. And this causes even more emissions of CO2 and the reduction of the carbon stocks in the soil. And what we have found, just speaking of carbon stocks, which of course we're all very interested in because of climate change and greenhouse gases. Um, what we found in our forests in British Columbia is that when they clear cut, we actually lose a lot of that soil carbon just from the, you know, just from cutting down the forest. A lot of that forest soil gets moved around or disturbed and it increases decomposition. And we found that we are losing a, between 60 and 80 percent of forest floor carbon right along with clear cutting. And so the consequences are huge, right? This is, so it affects the hydrology, as I mentioned, it affects carbon pools, and it affects the nutrient availability as well um, to the regrowing forest. So yeah, there's lots of downstream ripple effects from cutting down a forest. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I think this sort of leads us on to another question from Ian and Creef, who's asking, and the answer may seem obvious, but I'd be very grateful for your, your comprehensive views. Should we shift? therefore, from clear felling to continuous cover felling, i.e. thinning or small group felling? Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. And um, But in general, that's right. Um, but one of the cautionary principles is not to do the same thing everywhere. So we need a variety um, in the cover that we leave on the landscape, and it needs to be matched with local site conditions. And so, um, Certainly what we're doing, I have a big project in British Columbia that crosses a climate gradient that's the size of Denmark, um, and we're trying different ways of, of group selection or group felling and, and leaving groups of trees. And the, the configuration, um, you know, whether you leave individuals or leave groups and how big those groups should be depends on the climate region that you're in. So if it's a really moderate, you know, more, um, uh, uh, sort of very rich environment with, with like high rainfall, it's nice and warm, um, then you can actually leave fewer trees just to, to have the same effect as in a more poor ecosystem that's colder, um, where you would want to leave groups of trees to protect the new seedlings coming up. So, so the message there is don't do the same thing everywhere, but make sure you're matching it to the site conditions. Another cautionary principle about continuous cover forestry um, Again, like we don't want to do the same thing everywhere. In some places, it's not going to match up very well. Um, so for just to give an example, um, continuous cover forestry means that you you have you know a canopy that's still intact. Um, and in some areas, you actually need more open spaces for some species to regenerate. So things like like pines, pines need more space. And so if you want to, you know, encourage pine growth or or anything that's shade intolerant, you need to create bigger gaps than if you are growing back shade tolerant species like like um, in, in my case, in my world, it would be cedar trees or maybe in Europe, it would be beech trees. You would want to leave a, a more closed canopy for, for regeneration of those shade tolerant species. And so you can really, you can work with canopy cover to, um, you know, to a, to guide the development of the next forest and the species composition, which is really, uh, really sensitive to the amount of shade um, that is being cast over them as a consequence of your cutting patterns. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Stu, who's asking, what sort of understanding of some of the concepts you've been discussing was already known to indigenous cultures in Canada or elsewhere? Is this something you look at? It is definitely something I look at. And um, so uh, this idea of connection, which is what really, I think people really 
we all feel that this is intuitively makes sense and of course scientifically we know that this exists now um you know we've used western scientific tools to understand these these solid connections these internet below ground but you know if you i in talking to aboriginal people and even in some of the early writings and oral history there was an understanding already that these fungal networks uh, existed in the soil and that they um they supported they were the foundation of the forest um, and they and and these fungal networks were treated with a great deal of respect, as were the trees. In fact, you know, all creatures in the world of indigenous people are their relations, <laughs> and they are our relations, right? We're of the same genetic origins. And um, whereas in the Western world, we've tended to separate ourselves from nature and think that we're different, but we're actually not different we're just you know an interdependent with the whole ecosystem and that is really is the world view of of many <laughs> of indigenous cultures worldwide and so yeah that understanding is well known it's in language <laughs> it's in ancient languages of uh, words that uh, that describe this kind of connection what it means um the english language is not so so doesn't include so much of that but you know, in the cultures around where I live, like every single one of the, the hundreds of language languages here have words for this this idea that we're all connected together. Um, and and I continue to work. I work quite closely with Aboriginal people, Indigenous people in Canada to try to uh, reinvigorate our forests based on this idea of connection rather than disconnection, which is the is what what we've been doing industrially for for quite a long time now. Yes, can I just ask, um, obviously we've been speaking about your book, Finding the Mother Tree. Could you perhaps elaborate on the importance of the mother tree's role in looking after the forest? Yeah, yeah, I can. And I like that you called it the mother tree's role. So <laughs> it really is about the role, the role of the elder of the mother tree in the forest that's so important. So just to, you know, just to describe a little bit about why, you know, what is a mother tree? Well, they actually are the biggest and oldest trees in forests. Or if your forest is all of the same age, it would be just simply the biggest trees. And and the reason that they're so important is because they have, you know, they have big crowns, a big canopy. They photosynthesize a lot um, compared to smaller neighbors. A lot of that energy ends up, or at least, you know, it, between 30 and 80 percent of that energy, depending on the ecosystem, ends up being transmitted into the soil. And, and into the roots and into the mycorrhizal networks. And so um, so they are the big connectors. They've got more roots, they've got more points of connection and they connect to to many of the other trees in the forest. In, in making a map of our networks in, in British Columbia, we found that you know mother trees can be connected to 80% of the other trees in the forest. So they really are the nucleus. And then um, through our experimentation, we found that these old trees will in in forming these connections they provide like a a great platform for new seedlings to get going on so when a seed falls on the forest floor it grows a root it actually it, within a month or two it's hooks into this massive network that the old trees are supporting and then they benefit from that huge resource uptake capacity of the existing networks that is you know basically fed by the old trees the other thing that we found is that these old trees will transmit nutrients and water and carbon directly into seedlings um, to, to help them, give them a, a head start, to subsidize them until they have enough leaf area themselves to photosynthesize and support themselves. And even then they stay connected in this big network and you know, transmit information about their health and their, you know, their, their shading condition, their nutrition, their disease or whatever has happening to them. They, they all are perceiving this from each other. Um, and I, there's another important point that I wanted to make about the mother tree. So the, the mother tree really is mothering in a sense, the new generations of seedlings coming up. And these old trees can also recognize which ones are their own kin, um, which is brand new research coming out of you know labs in North America that trees um, recognize kin and they actually can support their kin through transmission of carbon to the mycorrhizal networks and to um, increase the nutrition of their own offspring. And, and of course that is, fits in with our ideas of natural selection that, you know, that they would favor their own genes so they can carry on to the next generations. And so, yeah, so that's what led us to calling them mother trees is just because of that, you know, that 
nurturing aspect of the old trees in the forest and how important these elders are in their role in doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very illuminating. Can I just ask on on forestry? I yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in your views as to the gendered nature of forestry as a profession. Um, yeah, what what's happening yeah. out there on the ground? Yeah, I mean it's changed dramatically over the span of my lifetime. When I started in forestry, of course, I described how I came from a forestry family, which of course was male dominated um my my grandmothers were not out there chopping down trees they were at home looking after the kids um and milking the cows and um you know keeping the home stable um while the men went out and logged and and then you know in because it it was such a male dominated industry that flavored you know our who was doing the science and who was doing the forest practices predominantly men. And so, of course, their viewpoints are what shaped those things, the science and then the practice. And so when, when women started coming into the field, which, you know, I entered in about 1980, um, there were very few of us. Most of the research, you know, very little had been done by women. And so that perspective was missing. And I think that um, now that there are more girls <laughs> coming into forestry, there is as many girls in forestry now as boys. And that's a good thing because then there's a diversity of understanding and how we look at forests. So, for example, this idea of connection and collaboration, you know, that was very much a that's a very much a female point of view, and it took female females to do, you know, to to carry that research forward. Whereas before, you know, it was and the practices still still today are heavily dominated by the idea that trees only compete with each other and that shaped forestry practices in dramatic ways. And competition was very much like uh, the thinking of, of men uh, and how forests were structured. They didn't really think about this collaborative social aspect of forests. And so growing, you know, tr plantations so that the trees are spaced apart uniformly, that they grow by themselves and compete for light and water. And that's, you know, it's all about the individual. Now we've changed that idea to know that, you know, that actually forests thrive in their social communities. Um, but it really did took, it took a lot of women in the field to change that pers perspective. But and it's and it's not trivial, you know, that 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 the, that perspective has not been there for so long, and um, because yeah, like I said, like forestry practices are completely shaped by the idea that competition reigns supreme. Um, how we plant trees, how we space them, how we weed them out, how we you know reduce the diversity in plantations to try to concentrate resources in those individual trees that will be the next crop. All of that is based on this idea that competition is what matters the most, and now we know that's not true. So um, that it's only one aspect of the many ways that trees interact and communicate with each other. So it's a good thing that you know there's a diversity of people working in in the field. You know that more women are getting involved, and more um, and you know a diversity of cultures as well. You know the idea of oneness and collaboration was long you know as, as we talked about before embedded in indigenous worldviews we need to get that back we need to incorporate those viewpoints into our practices now um, because those are sustainable practices and now i'm remembering one of the questions back was are there examples in the world of where we can see where this works and there are there are two examples come to mind one is the menominee forest in uh in northern united states I think it's in Wisconsin where the Menominee Nation has um, done selective harvesting of their forests in, um, for a hundred years or more, and those forests are, you know, they, they're they're accruing, you know, they get wood out of the forest to support their lives, but the forest is still intact. It's still a thriving, productive forest. Another example is are, is the wildwood forest on the east side of Vancouver Island, another selectively harvested forest that is producing even more uh, basal area or wood than it was before. So it definitely can be done to use these perspectives of, of connection, of society, of leaving the elders, of, of more continuous canopy cover or, or using partial retention. Um, these ideas work and uh, we've got lots of evidence around the world. Thank you. As someone who's obviously very happy working in forests, I, I'd like to ask how you feel about your work inspiring the world of film. 
such as the film Avatar, which apparently borrowed aspects of your work. And now we hear of the Amy Adams biopic of your life. Um, are you comfortable with that world of entertainment? I suppose it's, you know, it's got real power to carry these messages far and wide. It sure does. You know, <laughs> um, so far, so good, right? <laughs> uh, um, yes, there was Avatar. Um, although, you know, back when they made that movie, I was not really, I wasn't directly consulted on it, but but they read my papers. And so that did influence them in that way. Um, and, you know, James, or sorry, uh, uh, Richard Powers' book, The Overstory, you know, the main character, one of the main characters, Patricia Westerford, was based partially on my character. And all of that matters, right? It raises awareness in the public when they, when it's in popular culture like that, in popular media, films, books, you know, people are writing symphonies, people are writing operas, people are doing art using these concepts. And that all expands our, our awareness in the world of these connections. Um, and, but when it comes to Amy Adams and the biopic, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'm a little bit nervous about it because <laughs> who knows what that's going to turn out with. Uh, turn out like and um hopefully i my my hope is what it will do is that it will even expose even more you know what we're doing wrong and what we can do right um to help people move along so that we can be a more healing kind of planet instead of you know exploiting yeah well, thank you that that was a, a very interesting response and i'll certainly await the biopic with interest. Um, <laughs> you've spoken there about healing and, and some of your writing's been per very personal. You talk about the forest as a, and you've also spoken about, you know, the forest being all about connection and relationship. But you've spoken about the forest being a sanctuary when you were going through treatment for breast cancer. And I wonder if you'd be willing to expand on, yeah, just on that idea of why that, why that was so helpful for you at that point in time. Yeah, you know, uh, from growing up in forests, it was always, the forest was always a place of sanctuary for me and always, you know, that's where I, you know, I I feel good in forests. And I, it's not just me, people all around the world, it's well documented now that pe the healing aspect of being in a forest, forest bathing or, you know, and, and it actually, there's, you know, evidence of, of our, you know, how, how we change when we're in a forest, how we, we calm down, we, um, we have like positive hormonal responses to forests. There are even, you know, you know, the, the soil organisms in the soil, the things that we smell. <laughs> a lot of that is the cycle of the nutrients that's going on in the forest floor. We smell that and we feel good. It's life, right? It brings life to us. And so certainly, you know, when I was going through chemotherapy for breast cancer, I went to the forest as much as I possibly could. And um, one of the one of the the um, drugs in the chemotherapy was paclitaxel, and paclitaxel is a derivative of the yew tree. And I know you have yew trees in in the UK, in Scotland, um, that are can be a thousand or more years old. These are ancient trees, and they produce uh, taxol or or the the trade name paclitaxel as a defense uh, a defense enzyme themselves. Um, and so it protects them against disease and, and infections. And this was actually known by our Aboriginal people in, in North America for a long time and used as a, for its medicinal properties and tinctures and ointments and bathing um, to heal, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, heal illness. And so I would, when I, I knew this, right? And so I would go to the, the yew trees that live around me because my forests are full of yew as well. And um, and go and spend time with those yew trees and just give thanks uh, for for saving my life um, and taking my children and and being together with these trees. Um, and you know, one of the things I also did is I, I I made a promise to myself that I would try to give back. And and so I've got a new graduate student, uh, Eva, who is, Eva Snyder, who is working with yews and. And the idea is that the yew trees live in communities as well, right? They have neighbors, they're connected to other neighbors. In my world, they're maples and cedar trees um, and the ferns and the understory plants. And the idea that the community influences the health of the yew tree and that it influences the, the chemistry of those yew trees and the, and the paclitaxel that they produce 
And so we're trying to figure out whether or not there are certain community aspects that enhance uh, the ability of the yew tree to produce this amazing chemical that we have used and, and benefited from as human beings as well. Um, so that's that's her work and uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> it, it certainly is. And, and thank you for, for your answer there. Um, I think um, we would all agree that you have given back in so many ways and continue to do so. <laughs> Um, we're sort of we're beginning to run out of time just now. I think I've been really struck this evening by, well, you, I think you're. Would you say it was a fair summation that your your number one call really is about saving what we have? We are we are we are focused, I suppose, because we've got to the stage of having lost so many um, trees that we we have a real focus at the moment on planting. But I think it's fair to say that we simply cannot bear. Um, or contemplate the loss of any more of our of our great forests, and we really have to protect what we have. As a, you know, yes. if there was one, if there was one message that you'd like, you know, this is the festival of politics. If there was one message that you'd like to reach politicians and parliamentarians worldwide, what would that be? Oh, that would be it. I mean, it's to it's great to invest in trees and planting trees, and it gives people a sense of agency in healing the planet, and that's a good thing. But the first and foremost thing that we need to do, in addition to decarbonizing our energy sector, the, 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 the first thing we need to do in forests is to protect the old forests that we still have. Because you know, when you cut down those forests, as climate is changing, we're never gonna get them back, right? Because climate is changing so quickly that the forests won't come back the way that they were before. They're gonna be more, different species compositions. There's gonna be a much less carbon capital in them. We're going to lose so much biodiversity and carbon in the cutting down of these forests, and we can't afford to lose any more. We're in a biodiversity crisis and in a climate crisis, and those things are tightly entwined. They're, they feed back on each other. So yes, we need to save these old forests. And so how do you do that? Well, you know, there's all kinds of mechanisms that are coming up, market mechanisms that we really need to start really pushing, and and that is to make it profitable to save these forests instead of turning them into logs. So how do you do that? Well, you start valuing those other things um, that, that forests provide, so water, air, and so on. But one of the things that's easy for us to count that actually will take care of a lot of these other things is carbon. Um, and so I think it's an easy logical mechanism that we can really move on very quickly, um, and that is to, to buy carbon credits. Um, use whatever mechanism is in place to raise the price of carbon so that it matches the value of these ecosystems and then start bu buying them up so that these forests can be left intact. And then the cultures that are w living in them, and a lot of the intact forests are in Aboriginal cultures around the world, they map directly on each other, is to empower the people with enough funding which you can get through the carbon credits to um, to actually start stewarding their forests like they did for for thousands of years, they can look after the forests in the way they've known to do for for long, long like for millennia. So so to me, you know, saving these forests is first and foremost, and there are market mechanisms that are emerging, and we need to push those forward as quickly as we can, um, so that we can make sure that these remaining forests are left intact. Thank you. That that seems like a, a, a good point to, to end on, what we need to do and how we might go about it. Um, can I just begin to draw this evening's proceedings to a close? I'd like to thank you all for your contributions. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us online. Thank you so much for your questions and for making such a positive contribution to this excellent In Conversation event. But I'd particularly like to thank Professor Susan Suzanne Simard for giving us thank you for so much for giving us your time this evening and taking part. And can I just take this opportunity to remind everyone watching that the festival continues for one more day with panels on resilient cities and business innovation and solutions to to sustainability in big brains to big solutions and the role of culture in good health and well-being, as well as discussions on mental health and the inequalities created by COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I do hope that you'll be able to join us tomorrow too. But thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. For joining thank us. you so much. Hawa. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.